K-Wave 6 Radio and our host, Kirk Spencer, welcome you to our show, bringing positive messages to today's world. And now, here's Kirk. Hello and welcome to K-Wave 6 Radio. Uh, today my guest is a very gregarious, very happy-going guy who's got a lot of experience and I don't think we're going to have enough time to do an interview with him today because he has so much experience that he can share with us. But he has such a winning, loving, funny personality and very serious side as well. Uh, but he reminds me of when we were talking at one point, uh, we were talking about English as a second language and he says, English is my second language. My first language is Kentucky. <laughs> so... With that, we're going to introduce you to Doug Harold. How you doing? I'm good, Kirk. Going really, really good. Great to be with you today. I'm really thankful to be on, and it's a real honor. Well, I think the honor is mine because uh, when we were talking off air, uh, you just won me over with all your humor and your wisdom, wisdom being just life that you've lived and experienced. So, Doug, you've got a great story to tell. And as we talked about it offline, you choose a point where you want to start. Because we're going to talk about, for Doug, just talk about his journey through life to where he is now. And it's very interesting and very encouraging for those of you who have um, or that are experiencing life and wanting to know which corners to turn and you know, how to get where I'm going. Now, is... He will tell you and other people will tell you, you have to pay your dues to get where you're going. It's not just you're born, you graduate high school, and boom, you're right where you want to be. Maybe there's a few people that are that way, but the majority of us, no, we're not quite that way. So how do you figure it out, and how do you move on, move forward? So, Doug, tell us about you. Uh, well, I, um, I'm i in Cincinnati, northern Kentucky area. I... Uh, I never was little, but I was young one guy. But uh, you know, I uh, you know I had uh, done everything that you know sort of everybody tells you to do. I think um, the American dream. At forty, I found myself uh, being successful, wife, three daughters, a uh, great job. Uh, but on the inside, I, I found myself just you know not not really happy, uh, not not miserable, not angry, uh, but just empty, uh, not willing to let anybody see what was on. What was on the inside, I always felt like I had to give everybody what they wanted to see on the outside. And, and I got to the point after I had secured uh, the next level of my dream job to realize that I wasn't happy and realize that, you know, I'm really sick and tired of living this way. Mm-hmm. And uh, in my mind, I, you know, I had two options and, and one of them was a, a really, really bad option that I was probably too afraid to do, but just not being happy. So I decided to work, invest heavily in my emotional health and invest heavily in understanding uh, you know, what had taken place in my life to get me to that point. And, you know, one of the things, uh, Kurt, no matter where somebody is, that you can decide today to make a to make a change. And when you make a change, it doesn't happen overnight. So now I've been on this journey for seven years, uh, working really, really hard. Now I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I don't know that I'm 99% there, but I'm a long way from where I was. Uh, okay. And I still think the life we live needs to live continuously improving. But, you know, I realized that about, I lived the first 42 years of my life being uh, being really, you know, upset. Uh, I'm glad I changed my word that I was thinking because we were on the radio. <laughs> but, you know, I, I really lived my life being angry and upset for 42 years because my dad wasn't around. My dad had left uh, my mom and my brother and sister and I when we were when I was an infant. Uh, and then we moved in with our grandparents. And, you know, we were, you know, 1966 when I was born. Divorce really wasn't really wasn't popular in, 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 in nowhere Kentucky, you know, so yeah. we took a lot of shots and my dad never was around and and I you know, I realized that I'd lived my life being angry because my dad wasn't around instead of being thankful and understanding how blessed I was because I was raised with my grandparents and they loved me as their own. They taught me to work, they taught me character, they taught me love. But I never looked at life that way. I always just I always wanted to have a dad. I always felt like a second person because I didn't have a dad. Uh, dad wasn't a part of my life, but, but looking back at it now, after I began to emotionally work through some things and look at life as the blessing instead of the curse, I realized that, you know, the greatest thing ever happened to me, it was my dad not being around. 
Uh, and some might think that's coy, but you know that really is the truth. I mean, I got a, a couple of half brothers that my that my dad uh, had helped raise, and uh, and and they were you know with him, and and, and certainly uh, been through a whole lot worse stuff than than I've ever had to see and had to deal with. So, uh, but but honestly, that that experience, you know, when I when I look back at it, it left me to where I was empty, and and I had hundreds, maybe thousands of friends all over the world but but none of them would ever you know none of them would ever fill my heart because i would never let it satisfy me and along my my journey i you know asked my wife about four years ago you know you hurt the one you're closest to so certainly my wife took a beating emotionally for me not physically but just emotionally uh, even subconsciously and i told her one day in, in one of my dark hours i just want somebody to love me and you know and she said well you know what am i you think i've stuck around for all the joy and happiness you know and uh, and honestly, I, I realized uh, after I looked at that, that literally I have people all over the world that love me. I've been in Russia, I've been in Vietnam, been in the Philippines. I literally have people all over the world. But what I understood, Kurt, is is that I couldn't love me. I didn't think because of my experience with my dad and some other things, I didn't think I was lovable. Uh, so you know, unless you figure out that that you are worth something and that you are lovable, mm-hmm. uh, you can't believe that anybody loves you. So I spent the first forty three years in of my life doing for people because I wanted to be loved, but realizing now that they could never give me what I wanted because I'd never accepted it anyway. So mm-hmm. now since I've got a lot of emotional help and I've worked through this and I've invested lots of time and lots of money on this thing, now I do because I love and it makes all the difference in my heart. Uh, I can just live life now 95, 98% of the time really satisfied with joy and contentment and uh, but you know, and, and I say that in a you know six minute intro, but yet you know that's been seven years of very painful work, very hard work, uh, but it literally has changed my life. So that's why we started Time and Eternity. That's why I say that uh, you know the greatest investment that somebody can make is in themselves, mm-hmm. because that really makes a difference. And and sometime here. Uh, I'm gonna let you ask me a question or two, but I, I would like to cover before we get off. I get excited, Kurt. You know, you were worried about me. You know, you, were, you know, I've been up for like eight hours already, and I've been running wide open. And you said I wasn't ready. I'm thinking, man, this is what I do best because there really is hope. And and I would like to explain uh, for you and your listeners the apple tree. So don't let me get away without giving you the apple tree because I think that's really is a is a is a way to explain it to folks where to help them. Okay, no, yeah, you got me going. Uh, you're doing fine, and you're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I primed the pump, and you just went with it. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I was just, I, I, yeah, you got me laughing now. I forgot exactly what I was going to see. I put down the apple tree, so I won't forget it. But um, yeah, the thing that you were talking about. Uh, just last, what really got on my, well, got into my memory, got into my thoughts was that you're talking about uh, not being able to love yourself. And there's something that I usually say, and I, you know, in our off air time, we have talked about how many things that we find that we have in, in common with each other. And there's something that I normally say to people is you can't give what you don't have. And if you don't love yourself, you have no love to give. If you don't have five dollars and somebody wants to borrow five dollars, it's the same thing. Can I borrow five dollars? I don't have five dollars. Oh, okay. Can I get some love from you? I don't love myself. How can I love you? Yeah, you know, it's and it as you said, it is a painful thing to go through. Uh, I don't want to get off in my experiences because this show is about you, but um, it, it's just something that's really important for people to understand is. You have to give to yourself before you can give to somebody else because so many people are out there saying, I want to give, I want to give back to the community, I want to give to other people, but you can see within them there's something that's missing. You're trying to do something that you haven't given yourself. No, that's exactly right. And what, uh, you know, and that's so, so we're going to, you know, sort of design the show. We we need to talk like do three shows because I got so much I'd like to talk to you about, but <laughs> But, no problem. You know, that's, that's exactly it on the personal development side. You know, you can't give what you don't have. So, you know, I say for seven years, honestly, for seven years, every other Monday night, I've been going to see a child psychologist and I still go because there's still so much I want to learn. Uh-huh. Now it's not for me. Now it's because I want to give. So in the manufacturing world, 
we call that continuous improvement. So in my personal life, emotional life, it's continuous improvement. I read 12 or 15 books every month. Uh, I invest, you know, in, in exactly. I invest in me so I can give to others. And that is the key. And because you literally can't give what you don't have. And that is why a life should be lived with a continuous improvement mantra and with that personal development. You know, education, once we get through our formal education, all somebody told us that that's all that matters. And yet there's, I was so dumb at 25, it's not even funny, you know. Right. Uh, if I knew at 45 what, you know, at 25 what I knew at 45, we'd have probably taken over the world already, you know. But it's, it, <laughs> it's but true. it really is that that continuous improvement uh, and it's not for you. So now we're into the apple tree. So that's the principle of the apple tree. We're the apple tree. Mm-hmm. But once we give to the apple tree, once we put in, then other people get to enjoy the fruit, the fragrance, and the flower. But but if you don't give anything to the apple tree in, in the light of personal improvement, eventually it dies and all they do is cut it down and burn it up and it's not good for anything. Mm-hmm. So sometimes folks think, Kurt, you know, personal investment is – is selfish and arrogant. That's not what you and I are talking about. We're talking about investing in ourselves. Yes, we get the benefit of being a, get being better. We get the benefit of being a better dad, a better better husband, a better friend, a better worker, a better whatever. But everybody else gets the benefit because we're living. They also get permission to live, and they get to see, hey, I like what that guy's got. Well, you like what we got, the fruit, the flower, and the fragrance because we've invested Time, money, effort into continuously improving inside of our life. That's a, that's exactly what the apple tree is. So you led right there. Well, wasn't intentional, but yes, that works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? But that's exactly right what you're saying. Yeah, it's people don't understand. Is and as you said, uh, people don't understand the point of. You don't just arrive and then you sit on your haunches and go, oh, I've arrived. Now I can sit back and, well, there's a certain point that, yes, but you said it very well. You have to continue to make yourself better. If you don't, you've become that apple tree, as you said, that's just, no, it's just old and sooner or later somebody's going to cut it down and it's firewood or we just make it into something we can whittle or whatever. Um... I'm just sitting up here adding stuff to you, and I shouldn't be doing that. But anyhow, uh, tell us in a few minutes um, how you started doing things from, because you kind of covered your whole life so far, so let's kind of go back and let's do some detail stuff. Um, From, I don't know, say from high school to college. Got a few minutes to do that before we take a break. Okay, well, I got out of high school. And I'm going to tell you the truth, uh, and this is going to, you know, I got out of high school. I bluffed my way through high school. I was the teacher's pet, pet played football. Everybody loved me, you know. Um, you know, and uh, when I graduated high school, uh, Kurt, I was literally a functioning illiterate, literally. Uh, so I worked on the farm with my grandfather for about a year. He uh, unfortunately suddenly passed away. Then I went to work uh, for Hillshire Farm and Cons, a food manufacturer, and and then, uh, you know, my leadership skills and my work ethic got me, you know, promoted rapidly. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then I was, you know, not long after that, um, you know, I had uh, I had found uh, I'd found salvation in, in the Lord and he called me to preach. And I'm thinking at 25 years old, he called me to preach and I was being rapidly promoted throughout the organizations. And honestly, I couldn't read. So um, and nobody knew this, but my wife and I. So I began to work with her. Uh, my wife, it's proven point that, that women marry animals because if you saw my wife and she saw me, you'd get that she married one. But she, uh, you know, we began to work. She was, you know, top ten in the country academically, and, and she began to work with me and teaching me how to read, and we would work on it every night. And then since then, you know, I've read a book. I've uh, read lots of books. I wrote a book. I went back to school. I got my degree. Um, and, and honestly, uh, this is a – this is sad, but it's the truth, you know, about the continuous improvement. Every promotion that I ever gotten up until this last promotion as vice president of manufacturing at Warnick Foods, I had to learn to spell the title when I got it. Uh, right. But literally, the continuous improvement effort uh, changed my life. I put myself back through uh, school. I, I got my, my bachelor's degree, and now I read, write, uh, anything. But, uh, but you know, just sort of living in, 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 in what I call Hillbillyville, Kentucky, 
Uh, the only thing you ever did was go to work, so it didn't really matter if you read or not. Um, you know, I sort of bluffed my way through high school. I tell my girls I thought D stood for duck. Uh, you know, and, and uh, but but then finally I, I realized that I really needed to add something. And thanks to a lot of determination and my wife and, and her kindness and, and, you know, I learned how to read uh, and, and I learned how to, you know, how to how to study. And, and, you know, I got three daughters. All of them was in high in college last uh, semester. My oldest one just graduated, but they all made the dean's list. They all, uh, you know, take after their mom, thank God, you know, but, but that's my story. And then at 25, I learned how to read. I went back and got my degree, uh, you know, while working, uh, you know, and then just kept working. I left uh, uh, public life and in, 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 uh, as far as Warnick Foods in 97 and went and started my own business and, and tried that for a few years and realized that, you know, uh, with, with the economy and some other things that was going on. So I went back to Warnick Foods. Uh, you know, so I just had, had really have, uh, I've been fortunate to have a work ethic. I've been fortunate to, to really be gifted with, with leadership, uh, but then also to hone that gift. I mean, I think, you know, we all get gifts in life, but, you know, the difference between me and somebody else who got the same gift, you know, like Mark Twain said about uh, the person that can read and don't, the person that can't read, uh-huh. there's no difference at all, you know? Yeah. So that's that's sort of where, you know, where I was and where I started and, and, and I guess I was afraid at, at 19, 18, 19 to leave the family farm because I always had this tremendous sense of failure. I was always very terrified and afraid as a kid. Uh, and, and I guess in my heart, I had put so many projections on me uh, that, that I thought that, you know, I'm doomed to be a failure and I'd never make it. So, you know, sort of the working the family farm was sort of the easy button. Then when my grandfather died, it's like, okay, it's time to go get a job. And and I, I don't have, I know sooner or later you're going to ask me about regrets. I've done a lot of stupid things and I wish I could undo. But really the only, the truest regret and maybe the only regret that I got, Kurt, is uh, is my grandfather never seeing the man that I turned out to be. I am passing away when I was 18, a month before my 19th birthday uh, right. in life. That is my only regret because I really... At least in my mind, I thought that, man, he'd never think I'm going to make anything. And, and years later, my grandma would always tell me how proud he would have been of me. And my true only regret is, is that my grandfather, who loved me and raised me as his own, never got to see me turn out uh, to be what I've been. That's the only regret I got in life, honestly. Um, yeah, well, I've got a lot of mistakes, you know, but, but that regret is only one. I have one regret right now. I let you run a little bit over, but we've got to take a break. So people stay with us. We'll be right back with Doug Harold, and we're going to continue on with that part of his life where the regret is and some of the things that he's learned from there. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you ready to put an end to thinking about how you wish it were and take action? Take this step to find out more by going to coachingbyria.com and you can receive your free consultation session with Coach Rhea. Coach Rhea is a certified professional life coach with a passion to help make the difference in the world. Hello and welcome back. Today my guest is Doug Harold. Uh, you've heard a lot from him so far, and he's got a lot more to go. But where we left off uh, just before the break, he was talking about some of his regrets, about how he was he regretted his grandfather not being able to see the man that he turned out to be. But on the other side, I'm quite sure uh, your grandfather lives on in you. So he was that inspiration or part of that inspiration between your your grandmother and you and your mom uh, to become the man that you did become. It became something that you did a little bit later, but nonetheless, you did it. So continue on from there, your last regrets and how that inspiration got you to be who you are today. Um, Yeah, you know, and, and, and I say, you know, my only regret uh that doesn't mean that i haven't had all kinds of failure you know failure is is an event it's not final so if somebody hears this interview that knows me and that you know there's been a lot of opportunities where i've screwed up and i've got to say that i'm sorry 
Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that with my grandfather, the reason I really classified as my only regret is, is because, you know, when somebody leaves your life suddenly through death, there is nothing else. I mean, I've screwed up hundreds of thousands of times. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason I'm on here telling my story so other folks might not skin their knee where I skint mine, you know. Exactly. But, but inside of all of those, you know, I've had an opportunity, whether folks took it or not, I've had an opportunity to apologize and make those things right. So when I say that's my only regret, that's certainly not my only screw up. I mean, there's been lots of them. But, but you know, that thing is really because you're right. It, it was that character that, that he taught me. And, you know, when you're young, you know, you're 18 and you know everything. You don't know anything and, and mm -hmm. certainly... You don't recognize it until later, so that's that's what I mean, Kurt. It's just uh, it's such an honor to you know that somebody would love you and and really my grandparents had to start all over. I mean, their kids for all practical purposes were raised, and all of a sudden here comes three kids within that's you know three years and under, and you know and they did it with love and with grace uh, out of their poverty. I mean, you know we we were born in a small town and didn't have a lot. We raised the, on a farm and what we ate is what we grew uh you know and and so out of their poverty they sort of started over and, and and now looking back they just they loved us truly as if we were their own and um uh, and it's just it's frustrating that i couldn't learn that until i was 43 or 44 years old but i am really glad that i have learned it yeah you're talking about that and you're also talking about uh, your regrets and you said something and i want to ask you to elaborate on this uh, you're talking about failures, and there is an expression, I don't know if I'm the one who created it, but at any rate, the point basically is, without failures, we don't have a chance to learn, because if everything just comes to you easily, what are you learning? Yeah, well, and that's, you know, part part of, you know, everybody always said, well, where'd you go to school? I would always say HK University, you know, Hard Knocks University, uh -huh. when I went to school, you know, and but, uh, but yeah, and, and one of the things that truly that my passion to give back is, is because a lot of times in my life, I don't feel like very many folks invested in me or very many folks said, hey, watch out, you're headed for a cliff. Everybody said, hey, stupid, you fell over the cliff after I was over it. Mm -hmm. But not very many people gave me different ways to do things differently, so I wouldn't. Uh, you know, in, in your terms, so I wouldn't fail so often. So I really want to give back and teach personal development and professional development so folks can understand that they don't have to repeat the same cycle that the parents before, the parents before that, or even that we've repeated. We can actually work on it uh -huh. and, and change our behavior and change our understanding. Uh, you know, we're the ones that are able in, in the world, uh, humans are, to have intellect and think so you know so that's really my passion and i and i know it's even you know your hope is is to teach folks where you know you and i have, have messed up and, and then and then that you don't have to go that way and you don't have to stay there as long as you otherwise would have you can you know work yourself to a better place because you're willing to say okay there's a different way and i didn't really like the way that felt so i'm not going to do that no more <laughs> exactly yeah and part of that which makes you a good leader and from our conversation off air is that you can give that information but you don't have to force it on anybody it's just a thing of hey i can give you some help here or i'll give it to you or tell you what it is but I'm not going to force you to do it. It's your life. You have to make the decision. You have to make the decision to either follow what I tell you and to make it your own, or you can go do what you want to do and learn it the hard way. That's up to you. No, no that's exactly right. I have three daughters, 19, 20, and 22. And, uh, you know, and, and when they're younger, you can sort of direct it. Now I got I got three daughters that are grown women, and it's like, you know, I can help you if you ask, and sometimes you're not going to ask because you don't want to hear what Dad's got to say. But yeah, it's the same. It's the same thing, and and you know, let every man be fully persuaded in their own heart. You know, but it is that. Uh, it's that giving folks, and this is the whole emotional side. Uh, I think that 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 if we can give folks a safe place to be vulnerable, a safe place to just talk without being condemned and without being judged and without being ridiculed and laughed at, that that they can ask those questions. And and certainly, in, in, in I've been blessed in my model, my leadership life and my personal model to ask a lot of questions and to really give folks a safe place because, you know, there's a lot of people that want to talk to somebody, 
mm-hmm. but they're so afraid that somebody's going to condemn them because you know they've they've screwed up, they've messed up. Uh, that, that's reality. We all have fell down in the pit at different times, but to allow folks to have a safe place to talk about that, where they're not going to be judged and condemned, but they can just say, you know, hey, I, I this is one of my faults, and I don't like it about me, but I don't know how to change. You know, you got any thoughts? Uh, and and then you give them that opportunity to be vulnerable because our generation was taught that being vulnerable is weak, but yet being vulnerable is where you can actually have an honest conversation about where you're at. Yep. So you can find a tool or two in order to change where you're at in order to get somewhere different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you reminded me of how uh, a lot of people that I've known in my lifetime, especially when I was younger, you're talking about our generation when we were younger, being vulnerable was definitely a no-no. But I was one of those, and some of my family members will tell you, I'm one of the first people, if not the first person to go, when I made a mistake, I'm going to be the first one to say, I screwed up. Okay, now what do we do? Even when I was somewhat similar to you, I was a field manager for an international corporation back in Chicago when I lived there. People used to come into the meeting and there would always be a problem. And somebody would go, hey, that person caused the problem. And everybody else is chiming in, yeah, he caused the problem, he caused the problem. And I'm going, we know who caused the problems. Kind of like you saying, hey, dummy, you fell over the cliff. And like a friend of mine would look, he would do, he would look up and go, you think? (laughs) yeah exactly i don't need your help now tell me how to get out of this problem and that's what i would do in the in the meetings it's like we know that the problem exists the person knows that he made the problem if he's a female it doesn't matter but the person knows that they made the problem and they probably feel guilty about it enough let's not rub it in we're here to solve the problem so let's work on the solving and stop with the blaming uh, yeah, that's that's really a big deal. I mean, there's, you know, we we tend to look just for the blame, so we're not uh, able to be accused. But the blaming, you know, I always say, you know, <laughs> I always say that, you know, and I don't know if I can say this on air, so you can block it out if you don't like it. But the crap's already out of the horse, so let's just deal with it now. You know, too late. You know, uh, it's barn, okay. It'll stay in. <laughs> yeah, you know, but that's the, but you know, it's like you know they used to say, well, you know the. The horse is out of the barn. It's a little bit, you know, but but then let's let's just go and deal with it. A lot of times, because because of I think our reputation, uh, or at least the reputation we think we give, we we don't allow people to mess up because we think it we think it reflects on us. And even being a dad, you know, I got three amazing daughters, and and you know my daughters uh, are great girls. Um, but, you know, if they mess up, and often they do, I may be disappointed, but I'm not going to stop loving them, and we're going to work through it the, the best we can. So even somebody we care about or somebody that we work with, they might make up, mess up, and we might be disappointed. But like you said, okay, here's where we're at. What are we going to do to to remedy this situation? And then how are we going to keep it from happening again? And then we're going to move forward. And I think that is uh, your spot on. I think that's key. Yeah. Um. Let me see. You cover a lot of information in a short time, but I'm going to get you back into details a little bit. Um, let me see. You went from, let's see, high school, skating through, as we used to say, skating through high school, uh, working on the farm with your grandfather until he passed, unfortunately. Uh, grandmother telling you that he would have been so very proud. You went to work in another company, and yeah, tell us about the leadership skills in the next couple of minutes. Um, okay, see, I, I try to stay really high because I'm afraid I'll get too deep and I'll blow through another break. See, I'm, I'm working hard. <laughs> <laughs> so you just stop me and we'll go to break. But you okay. know, I, I went to work for Sara Lee, and, and then I just went to work as a warehouse worker, and then you know, the next thing you knew, I was promoted into a lead role. Uh, then I, at 21, I've put in for you know for a supervisor and the first one i didn't get uh they were wrong i might add Mm -hmm. but i didn't get it they chose somebody else but then six months later another one came up and i was promoted into supervisor and i was on night shift work night shift distribution supervisor for 
for years, about nine years, I worked night shift, and then, you know, we had two little baby girls, and we had a third baby girl on the way, and I'm thinking, it's getting harder and harder to sleep during the day. Mm-hmm. So uh, so at that point, um, uh, Warnick Foods uh, had moved from Evansville, Indiana to Cincinnati, Ohio, and I was able to literally take a lateral move uh, financially, but I was able to be... Uh, to take uh, a small company, Warnick Foods, as their warehouse manager, which was a day shift job. And literally, I traded my salary from night shift to day shift, and I was happy to get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went to Warnick Foods. That was in December of 94, uh, and as warehouse manager. And, and, you know, it was a very small operation, and I did it very well. Uh, so because, uh, you know, our warehouse ran so well, and I had a great team, uh, the key to being a great leader is just hiring really, really great people that make you look good, by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I've been fortunate enough to do that. Uh, so, you know, with the warehouse group, um, you know, we ran very well. And then I had opportunities to go out into other departments and begin to learn. And, uh, you know, I just was always happy to work uh, because I enjoyed work. So then I was able to be, you know, curious enough to start learning the operation, start learning about food manufacturing and food production uh, and then, uh, you know, in 97, I had, I had left to go do my own company, which was uh, concrete um, uh, construction, pouring, you know, pouring sidewalks and foundations and, and floors. So we had our own business and, and we did, you know, we did quite well uh, through, you know, through 2000. And then, um, you know, it, it had gotten tighter and tighter and, you know, you realize you're getting busier and busier and you're, you're turning more cash, but you're sort of working a little bit at the time for my employees because I, I was young and didn't know how to do it just right. And then Warnick uh, had contacted me about coming back and doing some consultant work on a, on a project that they were starting. And so I went back and it was very successful. And, and then um, in 2001, mm-hmm. they offered me the production, you know, began to really get inside of the manufacturing world to, to lead people inside of that and, and we'll stop there and let you go to break, and we can pick up if you want. <laughs> You're over there watching See, the clock, told aren't you? you? I'm ready. Yeah, I get nervous, man. I'm afraid we'll go too long. <laughs> Not a problem. As you say, you're watching the clock more than I am. All right. Since Doug is watching the clock, <laughs> okay. I, obviously, he's had enough experience talking on radio. So, anyhow. We'll take our little break, and we'll be right back, and we're going to continue on from what he did uh, when he went back to Warnock Food. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Pat Kammer, author of Lost Voice Changes You, book one. And I now have book two, which is called Hello Awesome, Message from Spirit in Pat's Patters. Buy your book from Amazon.com. Hi, this is Amy Young of JSJ Phone. We are providers of junior iPhone, iPad, iPod, also Samsung, Sony, Nokia parts and accessories at very good quality and low prices. We sell to individuals and companies have 3 to 5 days delivery time by DHL or UPS. We do delivery in 24 hours after payment confirmed. For more information, see our website www.jsjphone.com www.jsjphone.com Contact me Amy Young mailbox emy at jsjphone.com or by phone 0086-134-1800 Hey 
everybody. This is Jason Pockrant of Live to Give over at jasonpockrant.com, and you are listening to K Wave 6 Radio. Hi, and welcome back. Uh, I was just talking to Doug during the commercial break there, and Doug got me laughing, so I'm still laughing after that. I told you this man has got a wonderful sense of humor, but he also has a great deal of knowledge. Um, we're going to slow Doug down just a little bit, but uh, in our last segment for the show, we're going to get into what Doug is actually doing. So, uh, We left off talking about how you went back to Warnick Foods and as a, consulting, uh, as a consultant and how you got promoted into the position I believe you said you hold right now. So why don't you pick up from there? Well, yeah, I got uh, actually got promoted into into production manager, and then you know I worked my way up through the last uh, for about six months, and then went back to Warnick Foods. And and when I went back to Warnick Foods is when I was about forty, sort of where we started the show off, and and I had got a really great promotion, and and really started looking. Uh, I had everything. I had my wife, and I had three daughters, and a wonderful home, and a wonderful job. And on the inside, I was I was missing. could I really help you know and about 43 or 44 I really started to turn the corner to where I'd learned enough to begin to help people and then uh, about last um, May of 2000 maybe April 2013 I realized that uh, what I had was was really powerful and it really had changed my life changed the life of my daughters uh, the life of the people that I work for at Warnick, uh, the servant leadership model, the you know the 600 employees that historically folks say work for me, but I work for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I realized how much it had changed my life, and and I was doing some business conferences, and, and some precious lady, Teresa Black, who uh, who uh, had helped me write my book here. She said, "I want to write your story," and and I guess I was too humble or ashamed to realize that I had a story. And then I had a couple other folks said, we need to really write a book, you know, so that's a big deal, uh, you know, so to, so, so that's, so I decided to, to begin to write a book in September, my, my youngest daughter went to college and my wife and I became empty nesters. And all of a sudden, after 21 years of doing everything with our kids in mind, we were all of a sudden free. I started uh, to write a book and I started the business plan on time and eternity to uh to to help folks with where i've been you know so in hope for time and eternity my life through my eyes is my book uh i really just wanted to help people to know i believe you know as curtis you and i've talked i think we got a lot of answers to questions that most folks don't even know that they're questions yet Mm -hmm. so i had i had got over the stigma of of personal uh you know emotional health uh, you know, I know there's lots of people that wake up every morning uh, dreading to go to work and come home every night and go to bed wondering why I'm here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, I don't have to answer for that no more. I get it clearly, and so I wanted to write it. You know, I'd got past the stigma of what everybody in small town Kentucky thinks about you going to see a psychiatrist for help. But literally, it changed my life, and I wanted to tell other folks. So I'm still vice president of, of Warnick Foods. I love working there. But I wanted to help folks. I wanted to touch people inside of time uh, with an opportunity to, you know, to realize that time and eternity, you know, life doesn't 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 end here. But if we can help them inside of time, the quality of life, the joy inside of their family, the joy inside of their workplace. So last September, I started working on a business plan and my book. And in January 16th, we started Time and Eternity uh, Incorporated. um, And then the book came out about four weeks ago. Um, but really with a passion on helping people in their personal life, uh, you know, sort of the, the we call it the five fingers uh, relationship, uh, you know, relationship help with your family and your friends. Uh, so relationship, physical health, relationship health, physical health, um, emotional health, financial health, and spiritual health around those five. That's sort of the pillar of the personal development side. And then there's a professional development side and an organizational development side inside of, you know, what I've learned in manufacturing and what I've learned as, as uh, you know, help an organization. So sort of three, three distinct business. But life is all one. You know, you're doing your job today as we're talking. I think you've got to the place now where this job for you is not work. It's something you love to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, forever, we were told that life is... And, and family, life, family, and, and religion, all of those had to be separate. We are one being. 
Uh, and I've realized that everything I do in life is life. And I've learned to enjoy that and recognize that as sort of the oneness, you know, of, of what life is. And it's been a really, really big deal for me. So that's sort of how uh, rapidly that, that we had gotten to the point uh, of where I am today uh, with a passion to help people. Our website is in, uh, it's in Spanish, it's in Chinese, and it's in English. Uh, so about 98% of the people in the world are covered. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to I wanna go to China to help folks. Mm-hmm. I want to... I want to help people. I want to help people with, uh, you know, with I want to leave the world uh, better uh, than when I found it. And, you know, I say I want to make a difference. That's really what I want to do. I want to change mm-hmm. the world. And I think you change the world. You know, Maslow said back in the 60s, he was a, a psychiatrist. He said you can change the world through manufacturing. So that happens to be my skill set, along yeah. with all the stuff that I've learned with the personal development, and the emotional development. So that's sort of how I got to this point. I'm going to take you down a different little road. Actually, okay. not different, just a little variation off of a side road. Because I you said it. this a couple of times, and I actually want you to define what you think or what you live as an administrator. What does being an administrator mean to you? And I'll tell you what I'm thinking about to see if you cover it before I get to it. Uh, you know... For me, being an administrator is, is, you know, in my job, my job is to serve people. So being an administrator is hooking people with the right people, making sure that, you know, things are taken care of, uh, but making sure that you're developing other folks to take care of the things that they need to take care of. And just sort of, you know, making, you know, making connections. I don't think, I'm like you, I don't think anything happens by accident, Mm -hmm. but we also have to be, you know, intuitive enough to recognize that okay i need to look at this I need to understand this but uh, but that you know the the administrative side of of even leadership is you know i have nine or, or ten managers my job is to make them successful so what can i do for you today how can i serve you how can i help you uh i think that that model was a very old model and i think we got to the place where a lot of times it's big eyes and little U's, and I don't believe mm-hmm. that. I believe that I am what I am because I've had great people to work with me and work for me, and I've got to serve them. And, uh, you know, and if somebody wants to be successful, they need to not be afraid to really engage great people and use your talents to, to administer, you know, the gifts that you have. I don't know that I covered what you were looking for, but that's what I was thinking when you asked the question anyway. No, you did pretty good. Um, I was. This, this is something I did when I was young. I, a matter of fact, tell you about how things were. I wasn't quite the same as you going through high school. I didn't quite skate through, but I just couldn't adapt myself to uh, just following. Uh, well, let me put it this way: in education, uh, Mark Twain, since you quoted him already, he says, "I never let." Um, I never let education get get in the way of my learning or something like that. Mm-hmm. Basically, what he was just saying was uh, education tends to be normally something that people teach you, this is how you're supposed to do things in life. And instead of teaching you how to think, they teach you what to think. And I prefer learning how to think, how to reason my way through something. And... Uh, even when I was 18, I used to sit down with a dictionary. I think it used to floor my parents. I would sit down with a dictionary and just learn words and what they mean. And unfortunately, I've lost a lot of that, but nonetheless, there's probably still a lot of residual in there. But one of the things I did learn about the word administer or administration, I'm looking at a dictionary right now, management are to manage, to direct. And we're going to get into that in the last segment, but you have a thing about leadership because that's what leadership is. And you you did answer that, and you said it a couple of times even in your interview so far, was, uh, yes, I was the manager, but I was actually working for them. And that's, yes. that's, what it, uh, that's what I always felt that a manager was. I'm working for you. Or as I used to do when I was in management, I would tell my group of people was, you do what I tell you to do, and you do it the way that I tell you how to do it. Even if it's wrong and management, my management comes down on me, 
I will take the rap because I'm the one who told you to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they just went, okay, you got our back. We'll do whatever you tell us to do. And yeah. everything worked smoothly. No, that loyalty and that uh, taking care of folks is 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 a is a really big deal. Mm-hmm. And I um uh, and I I <laughs> I thought about something you said. You know, uh, the difference. You know, knowledge and and learning. I agree with what you said. You know, knowledge and wisdom. You know, knowledge is understanding that tomato is a fruit and wisdom is not putting into the fruit salad. Yeah, that's the difference. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, so yeah, that's uh, that's the big difference and, and to be able to learn to think. And one fellow said if everybody said what they were thinking, nobody would say anything because most folks never think. You know, and that's, <laughs> that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well... That, that you have a lot of that what we call from those of us who grew up in the north and even though I did attend college down in Alabama for a while which was usually got people going was uh, when I returned back up to the north he says you from Alabama no I just went to school there for three years <laughs> yes <laughs> um, that southern wisdom okay throw a little bit of that southern wisdom on us because it usually comes out very, it's very intelligent. It's just a colorful way of putting it, as we say it up north. No, that's, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, and, and I think practicality, I think one of my, honestly, one of my many gifts, and I don't mean that arrogantly, you know, one of my mm-hmm. many gifts is being able to put uh, put sometimes complicated or what folks think complicated, uh, complicated situations into just practical terms to where mm-hmm. folks can get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because if somebody if somebody don't get what you're saying, it really doesn't matter that you say it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, if you know they don't get the understanding thereof, it doesn't matter. But yeah, to be able to break it down and just uh, and just you know, good old fashioned common sense to where folks can get a hold of it. I mean, it's you know, it's a, it's a really big deal, and, and I'm, I'm thankful. You know, one of the one of the things that I love to do, and and probably being raised with my grandfather. I love to be around old people. I, got, I was in Houston, Texas last weekend, and I got to sit and talk with a uh, an 80 year old doctor, and and I loved that he talked for hours, and I listened for hours mm-hmm. because I love talking to older people because I know what I know. Yeah. I don't need to hear myself talk. I want to know what other people know, so that's exactly. why we listen, you know. And and it's just it's just that wisdom that you know that that sometimes our arrogance will get in the way of us getting, uh, and that's important to be able to sit and. I mean, I, you know, I know what I know. I mean, I'd rather be interviewing you and hear what you know, you know, but but that's a big deal for us to, you know, God gave you two ears and one mouth. You should lose them, use them proportionally, you know, mm-hmm. listen twice as often as you talk. Uh, and, and a lot of times everybody's got to talk because they want so badly to be important, but I would much rather listen and learn and be able to give and and give to me and be able to give to others because I'm learning. But I, I'm thankful that I was raised in, in small town Kentucky around a lot of country people that just had a lot of really, really good common practical sense. And I look forward to allowing that to help me change the world because that's what folks need. They need to get back to the basics and understand how just a tweak here and there could make a really big difference in their life. Let me take you, you said this and I like this. Um, When I was a kid, because actually, my father's my father's side of the family came from Cincinnati, and I used to sit back and listen to his his uncle, who was my great uncle, who was I was a teenager at the time or very young teenager, and he used to, he was eighty years old back then, and he used to sit back and talk about uh, when he was a kid and the river that he used to swim in and. I listened to my dad talking about where he grew up and how he used to do things when he was a kid. When we were kids, I'm a little bit older than you, but uh, when we were kids, and I think this is kind of a fall over from, uh, well, it's just a follow through in a, in a generation because we're not that far apart in age. Uh, kids in my time, at least the majority of us, used to love to sit down and listen to the older people. Because that was where the learning came from. Yes, and that's exactly. I mean, I you know, and I didn't know that you know I liked to sit down and listen. I just knew that I was around 
because of, you know, being raised basically with my grandparents. My mom went to work to support us. I was around lots of older folks and, and just loved. I mean, they would sit and whittle and talk, and they I, I loved it, and I still love it to this day. So, yeah, you're, you know, I don't know if I was that smart or if I was just that fortunate to be put in that place, but either way, I'm very thankful that I was had the ability to, to learn from that wisdom. Uh-huh. Well, folks, we're going to take our last break here, and when we come back with Doug Harold, we're going to let him talk about his book and his website called Time and Eternity. And I do have some questions from there, and I think you're going to enjoy his answers. So stay with us, and we'll be right back. Do you get writer's block or tongue-tied when you try to write or talk? Need a wordsmith for a script, article, or research paper? Let K-Wave 6 Productions help you with all of your audio, visual, editing, and language translation needs for your business or hobby. Does the thought of creating a website give you chills? We also have webmasters to help you with all your website needs. Remember, K-Wave 6 Productions. www.kwave6productions.tk Or email us at info.kwave6productions.tk This is Chad C. Meek, executive producer of Giant Rock the Movie, the greatest UFO story never told. You are listening to K-Wave 6 Radio Show with the illustrious Kirk Spencer, who just might be as crazy as me. Hi, and welcome back. Again, my guest today is Doug Harold, and now we've come to the end of our program in the next few minutes, and we're going to talk about Doug Harold's uh, website and book. And the website is timeandeternity.net. And Doug, why don't you tell us a little bit about that, and then I'll get you a couple of questions, and we'll go from there. We'll get you back to talk about it again next time. Okay, perfect. No, I really, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be on. Uh, yeah, timeandeternity.net is our website. Uh, it's around personal, professional, organizational development. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a, you know, investing in yourself is, is, as we've talked on the show, is one of the greatest things you can ever do. And, and uh, there's just a website with, you know, that you can go and browse all kinds of stuff. Uh, there's a website membership to where we send you uh, monthly newsletters, podcasts, uh, uh, you know, we do webinars, allow you to access to ask questions because it is nice to ask somebody a question that you've been through. And so that's our website, timeandeternity.net. Uh, we got a lot of good things going on. We're going to do uh, uh, the Next Generation Lean Leadership Conference here in Cincinnati uh, coming up in October with uh, uh, Mike Hoseas and, and myself presenting uh, leadership and, and uh, lean leadership for manufacturing uh, on my book. Uh, Kirk is uh, time in hope for time and eternity. My life through my eyes. Mm -hmm. It's just a quick read, um, 144 pages. Just a lot of what I've covered here today, but but really to give folks hope that no matter what their past is, you know our past doesn't have to be an excuse not to live in today and or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, we can we can look at our past, understand it, work through it, and then also live full today and and look forward to tomorrow instead of letting our past always be the thing that. That hindered us. So that's what I tried to write my book about. So in hope for time and eternity, folks can get it at Zulon Press, which is our publisher, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, our website, uh, timeandeternity.net. It's available. Uh, it's $12.99. Uh, and I always say this, somebody can't afford it. You send me an email, we'll send you one. It's not about selling books. It's about changing lives. And that's really with all of my heart. That's what I want to do. And that's what we're trying to do. You got me smiling again, uh, because that was one of the th biggest things that I do when I'm doing the show, is looking for people that have heart. They're putting their heart and their soul into something, which means if you're putting your heart and your soul into something, you will love what you're doing, and it will always go somewhere. It may not go as big as you want it, but it will always be there, and the people that you really attract are, are the ones that are genuinely looking for what you're doing. Uh, give one a quick example. When I was uh, teaching back in Chicago, I used to get upset 
and I would tell it to my principal at the time, my boss, who was the principal of the school, and I said, I didn't get to get through as much as I really wanted to. And what he did was he used to smile at me, he says, don't worry about getting a lot of stuff into the students. Worry about the quality, because they're always going to remember what you did teach them. Yep. So no, it's really good. Yeah. So that was one of the lessons that I learned from somebody who was a little bit older than me. But going by your website, the, you have four things here. Uh, I'm going to read them off that uh, as I did it, and I'd like to hear your uh, take on it because I know this is coming from you. Leadership, work, person, and company. So starting with leadership, what does that mean to you? I think we covered that in the last segment, but if you want to go through that lightly, go ahead. Uh, leadership is an action. Uh, you know, I, I really believe that. Uh, I believe that, you know, uh, leadership's not a title. Leadership is an action. No matter what aspect, as, as a dad, as a husband, as a friend, as an employee, as an employer, you know, leadership is an action. And somebody, my grandpa used to say, do something if it's wrong, you know. Somebody needs to do something, and you know everybody wants to complain about the state of a company or a state of a family or a state of a country or a state of a job, but yet nobody wants to do nothing about it. So mm-hmm. I think leadership's in action, so we need to lead. And eventually, if you start pulling hard enough, somebody else will, will eventually help you, and that's what I think leadership is. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. Um, what about work? Because you say learn manufacturing, and it has something to do with employees. Well, you know, work uh, inside of a business, I think it's got to be about the uh, mutual prosperity of both company and employees. Uh, I really do. I I realize that uh, what I do is about Warnick Foods, but I also realize I can't do it without those 600 people that are there every day. So it's about the mutual prosperity of both company and employee. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you can link people, employees into, uh, into a cause, and that cause is being successful every day, and that cause is... Let, giving them a scorecard that they know when they leave that, hey, we did it today. It's amazing how something as small as letting somebody know they accomplished something, what how that changes their daily outlook. So that's what work, you know, work is. I mean, it's and it can't be separate, but that's what it is. Let me ask you to elaborate on that one a little bit, because um, when I was field manager for this company, I was telling you back, back in Chicago, vice president, uh, used to have we would have I think it was weekly meetings with him and um, he asked one day he says what inspires your employees to work better and the majority of people around the table will always said more money more money more money thinking that giving the employee more money would make them happy well if you've got money and this is what he basically says is if you give them more money, but they're still working and they're feeling that they're working as basically as a slave, you know, that doesn't inspire them to do better. They, I'm given the explanation before I give what he said, basically. But anyway, the idea he was saying was bringing your employees into the process of doing the job. In other words, talking to them is you're saying lead them. If you give them leadership and ask them to actually put some input into it, now they feel like they're a part of the organization. Everybody wants to be a part of something, you know, and and then eventually carrots and sticks only go so far. But, you know, to to say, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. And guess what? We didn't get there today, but we've done a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. And then then getting their their interjection and, and getting them to be a part of something to where it's measurable and then it's like you can go home and say, hey, we met our goal today. Something as small as we met our goal today. And, you know, so if we meet our goal, automatically my boss is happy. Mm-hmm. So guess what? We met our goal. And, and it's the intrinsic value. We all need money to live. But it's the intrinsic value that makes us feel good about what we're doing and who we are. And that's a really big deal. Mm-hmm. You have another line. It says, and I believe I wrote this down quoting it person making better individuals and i underlined individuals because i wanted you to or it would like for you to actually spend a little bit more time on individuals 
Well, it goes back a little bit to the apple tree, but as individuals, uh, you know, I say <clears throat> once we can work through and understand who we are, once we are, 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 once we're satisfied with who we are, the where we are and the what we are no longer becomes near as important. Uh, so allowing folks to be individuals. Uh, so well, how do you allow folks to be an individual? Well, you be an individual yourself. You understand who you are and you enjoy who you are. And then all of a sudden you give other people to see that, you know, I can only be the best Doug Harold. I can't be, I can only be second, I can only be the second best Kurt. I can only be the second best president because you're Kurt. The president's the president, but I can be the absolute best Doug Harold. Mm-hmm. My, you know, we're different. Our fingerprints are different. Our DNA is different. So everybody is trying to be what everybody else is instead of just being who we are, who God has made us. And who, who we are as an individual is really, really powerful. But unfortunately, a lot of people, and we've told ourselves lies to the fact that we don't really believe that no more. So we need to change that and, and, and understand that being who we are is pretty special. And we can it's okay to let that person live. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll tell you more about that another time. But, uh, yes, you make me smile because I, I feel that inside. But I want to tie this with the last part, company, vision, focus, identification, and problem solving. Now, before I let you go with that one, uh, the, way, the way I'm thinking about this is I want you to tie it together, if you can, I know you can, or at least I trust that you can, is being an individual and being a part of a company and or a community. Because you know, you've talked about it earlier, about uh, how people in Kentucky look at, oh, you're doing this and you're doing that, and people are like, mm. But <clears throat> you as the individual are saying, I am an individual, I am a part of the community, but I have to be me. I'll let you run from there. Uh, yeah, you know, um, so, you know, so there's a... So there's a balance or there's a wholeness of life or a holistic approach. I mean, I am an individual, but, you know, I also am part of a family. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm also part of a company. I'm a vice president. Uh, I'm a leader. I'm a follower because, you know, I still follow the president. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so all of us understanding our roles, uh, you know, understanding the role that we're in and, and also having a plan for where we want to be in the next three to five years and then making sure that we're working inside of either our area of expertise or our personal development or professional development in order to get there, uh, I think is pretty good. Uh, You know, I'm glad everybody don't want my job, uh, Mm -hmm. but it is okay to want the next job, and it's also okay to be content in the job that you're at. but, But either if you want the next job, you get the next job by doing the next job already, and, you know, and if you want your job, just do it very well and be a part of a really, really special team. So, you know, being who you are is OK, but it doesn't mean that we get to disconnect. So that that sort of wholeness of of being who we are, whether we're, you know, at the town council or whether we're at work, uh, you know, you don't have to be a jerk for the fact of being a jerk. Sometimes you got to pull as a team. Uh, but but as an individual, as long as you keep growing, you can even keep affecting the team. So even in our professional development model, I believe if I take somebody, Kirk, and I work with them a year on their personal development, and their, you know, they'll be a better father, a better mother, a better a dad, a better, you know, a better everything, a better employee, a better person, because they themselves have invested and they've grown, and then all of a sudden everything we affect gets better uh, holistically because we have got. Please stay tuned. We're suffering technical difficulties, but we'll be right back. Sorry about that, folks. Um, we do all of, uh, I do all of my shows by Skype, and if you've ever worked with Skype, sometimes we have problems with it. But anyway, Doug, you were finishing up on community and individuality. Yeah, I just think uh, to understand that, you know, as we grow as an individual, that we make everything and everybody better because we're growing and then everybody else gets the benefit of that and that's that's what i was saying and and i really i really think that the better the individual the the better benefit everybody else gets from it 
Definitely. So tell us again uh, about your website and your book and your website address. Uh, Timeandeternity.net. Timeandeternity.net. Uh, and Hope for Time and Eternity, uh, My Life Through My Eyes is my book. Uh, it's at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Zulon Press. And also you can find it on the resource page of of our website, timeandeternity.net. Uh, there's also a phone number there. You can reach us. Uh, my partner, Dr. Dr. Bobby Sparks, or me, send us an email. We'd love to hear from, from you. And, Kurt, I really, really appreciate you having me on. I definitely appreciate having you here, and as we've already agreed when we were off air, uh, you are definitely welcome to come back anytime you want to. Uh, as a matter of fact, for those who are listening, if you like hearing Doug uh, Harold, uh, he has pretty much agreed to be back within probably two months, give or take, and uh, yes. we'll be glad to have him back again, because he's got a lot more to tell you than what you heard here today. So with that, I want to thank you everybody for being here, uh, for depending on how you're listening to this, remember on our homepage, uh, we have um, podcast.com if you want to listen to us by podcast or iTunes. You can listen to us on iTunes on your cell phones. Uh, Stitcher, if you can't do iTunes, Stitcher is there. We have an RSS feed. And if you prefer, you can also find us on our YouTube channel, which is a link built in. Just click on any of the, the words that are there, uh, podcast.com iTunes, Stitcher, RSS feed, which is at the bottom there, and YouTube. And we also want to ask you to support our advertisers. If you heard them on the show but you didn't get the chance to hear everything, uh, you can go to our advertisers page and just click on their webpage links that are there, and it'll take you straight to their websites. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Doug, thank you once again for being here on the show with us, and we look forward to your next interview time with us. All right. Thank you very much, Kurt. I appreciate it. All righty. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you for being part of our audience. For more information about K-Wave 6 Radio and the services we offer, go to www.kwave6radio.tk. Have a wonderful day.